One day, early in March, I wandered over uninvited to the dead-end street backing onto the school playground where Alvin had begun shooting craps and playing po stud poker if the afternoon was warm enough and it wasn't raining. He was barely in the house anymore when I got home after school, and though generally he made it back by 5.30 for dinner, after dessert he'd head out to the hot dog hangout a block from our house to meet up with his old high school friends, a few of whom used to pump gas at the Esso stations owned by Simkowitz and had been fired along with him for stealing from the boss. I'd be asleep by the time he got in for the night, and only when he removed his leg and began hopping to and from the bathroom did I open my eyes and mumble his name before falling back to sleep. Some seven weeks after he'd moved into the bed beside mine, I ceased to be indispensable, and abruptly found myself bereft of the mesmeric surrogate he'd been for Sandy. Vanished now from my side of the stardom masterminded for him by Aunt Evelyn, the maimed and suffering American pariah who had come to loom larger for me than any man I'd ever known, including my father, whose passionate struggles had become my own, whose future I fretted over when I should have been listening to the teacher in class, had begun to buddy up with some good-for-nothings who'd helped him turn into a petty thief at sixteen. He appeared to have lost in combat along with his leg, was what he appeared to have lost in combat along with his leg, with every decent habit inculcated in him when he live, when he was living as my parents' ward. Nor did he display any interest in the fight against fascism, which two years earlier no one could restrain him from joining. In fact, he went scooting out of the house on his artificial leg every... In fact, why he went scooting out of the house on his artificial leg every night was at the beginning anyway, largely to avoid having to sit in the living room while my father read the war news aloud from the paper. There was no campaign against the Axis powers that my father didn't agonize about, particularly when things went badly for the Soviet Union and Great Britain, and it was clear how urgently they needed the U.S. arms embargoed by Lindbergh and the Republican Congress. By this time, my father could deploy the terminology of a war strategist quite proficiently when he expatiated on the need for the British, Australians, and Dutch to prevent the Japanese, who, in sweeping across Southeast Asia, exhibited all the righteous cruelty of the racially superior from proceeding westward into India and southward into New Zealand and on to Australia. In the early months of 1942, the Pacific War news that he read, that he read to us was uniformly bad. There was a successful Japanese drive into Burma, the Japanese capture of Malaya, the Japanese bombing of New Guinea, and, after devastating attacks from the sea and air and the capturing of tens of thousands of British and Dutch troops on the ground, the fall of Singapore, Borneo, Sumatra, and Java. But it was the progress of the Russian campaign that upset my father most. The year before, when the Germans appeared to be on the verge of overturning every major city in the western half of the Soviet Union, including Kiev, from whose environs my maternal grandparents had emerged to America, had emigrated to America in the 1890s, the names of even lesser Russian cities, like Petrozavodsk, Novgorod, Dnipropetrovsk, and Taganrog, had become as familiar to me as the capitals of the 48 states. In the winter of 1941-1942, the Russians had staged the impossible counterattacks that broke the sieges of Leningrad, Moscow, and Stalingrad. But by March, the Germans had regrouped from their winter catastrophe and demonstrated by the troop movements mapped out in the Newark News where, re where reinforcing for a spring offensive to conquer the Caucasus. My father explained that what made the prospect of a Russian collapse so awful was that it would represent to the world the invincibility of the German war machine. The vast natural resources of the Soviet Union would fall into German hands, and the Russian people would be forced to serve the Third Reich. Worst of all, for us, was that with Germany's eastward advance, millions and millions of Russian Jews would come under the control of an occupying army equipped in every way to implement Hitler's messianic program to deliver humi to deliver humanity from the clutches of the Jews. According to my father, the brutal triumph of anti-democratic militarism was imminent just about everywhere. The massacre of Russian Jewry, including members of my mother's extended family, was all but at hand, and Alvin didn't care one bit. No longer was he burdened by concern for anyone's suffering other than his own. And we will pause there.